Hey, I'm Brandon, the online campus pastor here at Big Valley Grace, and thank you for taking a moment to watch this message. It is the teaching portion from one of our live weekend worship gatherings, and we have those every single weekend here online and in person, and I just want to extend an invitation to you to join us. We're just a local church, local body of believers, and we would love if you would join us uh, on a weekend upcoming here sometime soon. Uh, but as we get headed into this message together, a couple things just want to point you to. One is a connect card. If there's any way that, that we can pray for you, if you want to contact us, that connect card form is just a really great way uh, to let us know that you're joining us. Any next steps you want to take, stuff like that is right on there. Also, if you want to bring in offering, a worshipful gift uh, to King Jesus, you can do that right on our give page on our website or via text. So hope you enjoy the unpacking, the unfolding of the word as we look at it together. It would be really crummy if... Um... I just kind of got into this and, and I didn't take a second to lead us in a moment of prayer for what's happening over in Syria and in Turkey. Uh, the latest death toll from the earthquake that was there is almost 30,000 people. And it's probably gonna be higher. And so there's just a lot of heartache and sorrow and carnage and that's going on over there and it's, it's a horrible thing and we as God's people need to pray for them and somehow, some way, I believe the Lord will use this to his glory because we believe in what Romans 8 says, right? That God causes all things to work together for good. He, he doesn't take bad things and make them good. Bad things are bad things. But he's able to take these bad things and somehow um, he uses them for, for good. And so, Father, we just want to stop and just pray for all the broken families Kids no longer have their moms and dads, and dads no longer have their, their kids, and aunts and uncles are now gone, and boy, there's people they can't even find, and it's just it's a mess, Lord. It's a mess. And I'm reminded of what the scriptures say, that you are close to the brokenhearted. And so I know, Lord, you are close to a lot of people, tens of thousands of people, you're close. And I believe, Lord, in the midst of all this crumminess, you're at work, Lord. Especially use the believers that are there. There's not a lot, but use them in great ways, Father. And, um, we pray these things in your name. Amen. 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 Okay. Um, if you have a Bible, you can uh, turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Okay, if you don't have a Bible, one of the things that we love to do is give Bibles away, and you can go into the altar room. We're done. Pick one up. I was talking with uh, a Christian leader of another church and they're gonna be going to India. Literally, I was talking with them this week and they wanted to know if somehow, some way, Big Valley could um, help them purchase 100 Bibles to take to India in their language. And I said, absolutely, it's one of the things that we, the people here at Big Valley Grace, we love to do. When, when we give, when we worship the Lord through our giving, a piece of that goes to purchase Bibles for us here and in lots of places. And so this week we'll be getting them a check. And, uh, and as their church goes on this missions trip, uh, we got a piece of it. But if you need a Bible, all you gotta do is just go into the altar room when we're done. Now, John makes this statement in John chapter one. From his abundance, Okay, from God's abundance, we have all received one gracious blessing after another. 
And I want you to know, this, this has very little to do with the message, but I couldn't get my mind off it. As I was studying for this, and Pastor Lonnie is going to be on the series campus uh, tomorrow, for whatever reason, the Holy Spirit kept drawing me to this passage, and I, I, I couldn't help but just spend time thinking about it and dwelling on it. This is one of the, the great truths that you find in this book. This book is filled with incredible promises and truths for us, for God's people. And this is certainly one of them. If you know Jesus Christ as your savior, if you've given your life to him, if you've surrendered your life to him, if you've uh, let him become the CEO of your life, I, I, however you want to word it, man, the, the, the blessings that have been bestowed upon you is, is crazy. God allowed his son to die a horrible death on a cross for you. Some of you have been coming to this church so long, you walked in here, you didn't even notice the cross. I'm pointing it out right now. You see that cross right there? I'm pointing it out to you. You just come in here so often, you didn't even think about it. Just, there it is. There's, there's a cross, and there it is. That's a sign of just, man, a God who loves you deeply. God chose you to be a part of his family. He chose you. He didn't choose him. Your sin wouldn't allow you to choose him. Your sin is diametrically opposed to anything holy and godly. And so that's why the Bible says he chose you, because you couldn't choose him. He drew you to himself. He redeemed your life from the pit of hell. Man, there was a moment when I was headed for a Christless eternity. And so are you. Not anymore. And I've walked with God so long, maybe this is why God had me go there, so that I would just spend some time thinking about some of these incredible blessings that are mine. God forgave us of our sin. God gave you the Holy Spirit to indwell you while you're down here on this planet. He lives inside of you. God, God made his power available to you to help navigate you through this thing called life. You have his Holy Spirit in you. God gave you direct access to himself. Literally, just a, just a moment ago, I was talking with the king of kings and the lord of lords, and he was listening. Seven billion people on the planet, and somehow, someway, he was locked onto my prayer right there. Crud, when my three kids talked to me at one time, I can't, you know, flat, ah, quiet, something, one at a time, you know. My God. When you pray, he's listening. There's nobody else. It's like nobody else is in the room. He's hearing you. You can do that. God made you a, an heir of everything he has. Oh, my, I'm, I'm my sister's uh, executor. I'm our only like relative. Yeah, so uh, we went down, I hated this, I hated every minute of it. We went down and met with the attorney, you know, and you know, whatever, I'm not even listening, because I don't want to listen, but I got to be there. You know, you're talking about her stuff when she dies, like, like, like I don't want to be here. I want you just to live and spend it all, and when it's all said and done, you know, I got nothing, you know. But uh, I'm her heir. I'm going to get everything. Even the stuff I don't even want, or the little knick-knack stuff, they're stupid. I don't want that stuff. I'm going to get it all. <laughs> Guess what? You're going to get it all from God. You're, you're his heir. When was the last time you thought about that blessing? 
God's prepared a home in heaven for you when you die. And this isn't even a comprehensive list. I could have gone on and on and on and on and on about all the things that God has done for us as people. John was right, wasn't he? From his abundance, we have all received one gracious blessing after another. And here's the bizarre thing. None of us deserve anything. We don't deserve a thing. Nothing. Like, like nothing. Like zero. And yet our God, who's full of love and grace and mercy and all these things, oh man, is he, he's crazy about us. Huh. And it's because he's crazy about us that we need to take what his word says seriously. We, we don't want to do what God says and obey God's word and live holy and righteous lives because God's ready, you know, to just kick us in the rear if we blow it or he's just, you know, he's just waiting, you know. That's it, bam, you blew it. And that's the way a lot of people, you know, it's kind of how they view God. He's just waiting to pound me because maybe your, maybe your earthly father was that way. It's not our Heavenly Father. He, he just blesses us with all these things and cool stuff and wonderful stuff. And it's because of that. That's what motivates us. That's what motivates us to want to read the scriptures and study the scriptures and meditate on the scriptures and, and I don't know, uh, memorize the scriptures. All with the heart that we would actually do what it says. That we would live it out because our God is so fantastic. He's so cool. And so as we study this tonight, and it's a pretty simple topic, I can't tell you how many times, I've taught this lesson, not this exact lesson, but this topic to junior hires and high schoolers and to men. Uh, I've taught it here from this pulpit, ah, I don't know, five or six times probably in all the years that I've been here. It's a pretty simple topic and, and I, you know, it's, it's, it's easy to understand. You'll get it. The issue is, is whether you're going to take any action on it. And that I can't do. Lonnie can't do that. All we can do is just tell you what the word says, man, and, and hope that somehow we're encouraging you to go, okay, I'm going to do that. I got I to gotta, like, actually do what it says. Now, with all this said, we're in this campaign, this brand new series campaign called Built to Last, which basically has two thoughts to it. And I'm going to boil this down and make it me. Okay? The first one is this, is we're trying to raise money to replace our 16,000 square feet of old portable buildings with a new building that's built to last because portables aren't built to last. Okay, we got all this square footage out there and it's been there for like ever. The Lord has like answered our prayers. Those buildings have lasted so long, it's crazy, but at some moment, they're, they're, they're just not gonna last any longer. We gotta replace them. We need buildings that are built to last. In other words, we need, you know, like real, real buildings. And we got the space for it, it's all set up, we're ready to go. We just need some shekels. But it's number two that's way more weightier. I mean, what good is it if we just build a building and there, there it sits? It's, it's, number, it's number two. We want to disciple and equip our younger generation with a faith that is built to last. All this building is right here is just a tool. The Bible says that God doesn't indwell a, a building made with man's hands. God's not floating around in here, you know, waiting for you to show up here next Saturday night. Okay? He doesn't indwell this kind of building. 
He indwells you. You're the temple of the Holy Spirit. You're the building that God lives in. What these are, though, are tools. It's a, it's a space. It's a sacred space, a, a holy space. It's, it's set apart for one reason and one reason only. And that's for holy and righteous things like the teaching of the word, gathering men to hear the word, gathering women to hear the word, gathering teenagers to hear the word, children to hear the the word. This is is holy ground, this building here. We, We don't let shenanigans go on in this building. We don't let it just anybody rent this building out and use this sacred piece of land here that some people sacrifice in incredible ways for shenanigans. It's used for a purpose, a holy, godly purpose, and that's what that building out there is gonna be used for. As we, we just got this really crummy culture we're living in. I thought the culture was crummy when I was doing youth ministry here. Man, it ain't nothing compared to where, where, where this, this is Looney Town. We're, we're literally, this is Looney Town. Our country is a Looney Town. And man, we need some space where we can get teenagers and, and, and adolescents together and, and help them understand the truth so they would have a faith that is built to to last. In fact, if you were to look at our entire theme or our logo, it says this, equipping faith that is built to last in a decaying culture. That's a beautiful theme, Like, like a really beautiful theme. At first, I didn't get it when it was first laid out. Yeah, I don't know. I had to read it a few times, and I went... I get it. I love it. I can't even tell you how many times I've said it, thought about it, especially, you know, Lonnie and I, preachers here at the church. I mean, we've got to look at this, talk about it. We're always running things through our brains and trying to figure out what we're going to say, or do, whatever all that is. And man, it's, it's, it's just super powerful. And I want you to know that God's already at work through this thing. Already at work. And we're like one week into it. Lonnie and I and Pastor Rich Sass, we were sitting at a table the other day, uh, Tuesday morning. Uh, we had a meeting and we were with a bunch of guys who were sitting around a table. And one of the guys goes, yeah, <laughs> I've been going to men. I've been learning men. You know, I've been learning the word of God at men's ministry. I've been hearing the word of God at men's ministry. And then I came last weekend I took my packet home, and he said, I knew, I knew what I had to do, and he said, I think it's this weekend. This weekend will be the first time he actually obeys the word of God and gives. He's gonna start giving. I get goosebumps again thinking about it. Not because, you know, somehow we got more shuckles here at the church, it's, it's the fact that this guy is obeying the word of God. It's, it's easy to sit here and listen to truth. It's easy, you know, to go through your, your daily readings and read truth. That's easy. Anybody can do that. Anybody can listen to a sermon. Anybody could sit on a Judean hillside and hear Jesus preach. That's easy. The hard part is is when you read something or you hear something to go, man, I'm actually going to do it. And I think what we have today as a church, not necessarily this one, but I know there are people here that are great hearers of the word, but they're just not doers of it. And God said through our brother James, hey, look, just don't be a hearer of the word. Just don't read the word or come to a sermon like this and go home but actually do it. And we have all the motivation we need, right? I mean, God has blessed us in some incredible ways. It's crazy how God has blessed us. Okay, I'm gonna read our our text and we're uh, we're gonna fly through this thing. 
So Ephesians chapter four, look at verse one. Therefore, I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling. This is the great apostle Paul writing this, right? God speaking through Paul. Man, I beg you, live a life worthy of your call. You're, 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 you're a believer. You're a follower of Christ. You bear the name of Christ. Man, live a life worthy of that. And you can't separate that from living this out, right? Can't do that. For you've all been called by God. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other. Make an allowances for each other's faults because of your love. Verse three says, make every effort to keep yourselves united in the spirit, binding yourself together with peace. For there is one body and one spirit, just as you have been called to one glorious hope for the future. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and father of all. He is over all, in all, and living through all. Now here's verse seven, here we go. This is where I'm gonna zero in. Okay? We got this big spotlight. And now it's, it's gonna be a laser beam here, right now. Are you ready? However, he has given each one of us a special gift through the generosity of Christ. Drop down to verse 11. Now these are the gifts Christ gave the church, the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, and the pastor, pastors and teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we are mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. Verse 14. Then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. Instead, verse 15 says, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of the body, the church. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly as each part does its own special work. It helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. Now, in the 30 seconds that I have left, no, um, <laughs> I don't have much time. You know, you can read the Sermon on the Mount, the greatest sermon ever. I think it takes like three minutes to read the Sermon on the Mount. Greatest sermon ever, three minutes. So it doesn't have to be long to be good. I only got a few minutes here, so pay attention. Here we go. I wanna give you three things, just three quick thoughts, okay? <clears throat> and we're really looking at that first word, equipping. Equipping faith, right? We're looking at the first word, equipping. God has given you at least one spiritual gift. Okay, this is, this is Christianity 101, but it's good to revisit it. Ephesians 4, 7 says, he, that's God, has given each one of us a special gift through the generosity of Christ. He's given each one of you. And no, no one's gonna say Jesus is a liar. So he says, if you know Christ, as your savior, if you're a follower of Jesus, you've been, you got some gift, you got something. Most of us have multiple gifts. In fact, I would say probably everybody in this room has multiple gifts that God in his generosity, when you gave your life to him, just gave you these gifts, these talents, whatever they, whatever they might be. And I want you to know, if you're sitting out there right now and you're going, ah, Pastor Rick, you don't know me, man. I, I don't have anything. That's a lie from the devil himself. It's a lie from the demons. You're buying a lie. You're being tricked. You're not mature in the faith because that is a lie. You may not know what it is. I get that. I remember when I didn't know. But the reality is 
you've been given at least one gift. And, and I, I'm telling you, it, it, it's multiple gifts. And here's the deal. He expects you to use that gift. He didn't give it to you, so you sit around and do nothing with it. Even if you don't know what it is, he, he didn't give it to you, so you just sit around and, you know, come to church and then, you know, leave and then come back and leave and go to another Bible study and learn some more and leave and, you know, listen to a podcast and leave and not do anything. Oh, all knowledge does is puff you up. And there's a whole bunch of Christians that are just puffed up, man. They know a lot. God doesn't want you just to know a lot. He does want you to know a lot, but he just, that's not it. He wants you to use this, this, these gifts he's given you. Aren't you glad these people did? Weren't you, wasn't your life enriched because of what they did? And I'll guarantee you, the devil and the demons are gonna do everything they can to try to get you not to do stuff. The devil and the demons, man, they, they should go, when you go to bed tonight, they're gonna try to figure out how to make sure you believe the lie. And you don't use your gifts and your talents. You know, I'm no good. I did this. I did that. Man, I can't serve. There's no way. You know, what are you talking about, man? If only righteous, good people, you know, <laughs> perfect people could serve. You know, don't show up here next week because there ain't anybody going to be here. Nobody's going to do it. Or we'd all be, you know, hypocrites. Paul said this in 1 Corinthians 7. He said, I wish that all men were as I am. And here's what's interesting. He's talking about being single here. He's saying, I wish that you were all single like I were. Now, he's not saying that being married isn't a good thing. He's just saying, I just wish you were single because if you were single, man, you can really give a lot of juice to the kingdom work. Because those us guys that are married, you know what, I, I got a wife, I got kids, I got stuff, I gotta mow the lawn, I gotta go do things, I gotta, you know, whatever all the things are I gotta do, I gotta, I got, I, Paul didn't have to do any of that. He just wake up and serve. I remember when I did youth ministry here, when I started, I was a single guy. Ha! Woo! I could stay up till 3 a.m., I could have overnighters, wake up, do whatever. Didn't have to think about anything. Didn't have to shower. Didn't have to do a thing. <laughs> then all of a sudden I got married and it was like, oh, you don't want kids over until three o'clock in the morning? I wish I'd have, I probably should have talked about that in premarital. <laughs> you know, oh, I like got a shower now? What, what's happening? <laughs> I'm joking, but you get the point. So he says, I, I wish you, all men were like me. But each man has his own gift from God. One has this gift, one has another. In other words, he is talking about marriage here. Hey, some of you have the gift of marriage. That's a gift. God gave you a gift. You have a spouse. Praise the Lord. But it also deals with other things other than the, just the gift of marriage. He's saying it's a gift to be single. It's a gift to be married. But there are all kinds of gifts, he's saying. Romans chapter 12 gives us a little taste of what some of those gifts might be. In his grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, speak out with as much faith as God has given you. If your gift is serving others, serve them well. If you are a teacher, teach well. If your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging. If, you're, if it is a gift of giving, give generously. If God has given you the leadership ability, take the responsibility serious. And if you have the gift of showing kindness to others, do it gladly. There are some gifts that I know that God wants us all to have. One of them is giving. He wants us all to give. You can't miss it in his word. He, wants us to, he loves a cheerful giver. Let me give you a way you can figure out that packet. I'm Mr. Practicality, Mr. Pragmatic. Here's what I did. I'm looking at it going, okay, what am I gonna give to this building campaign? And no joke, it's a two-year thing. You'll see it in the packet. I wrote down a number, and I went, two years, every month for 12 months? I didn't have any joy over that number. 
I said, that ain't the number. I can't be cheerful over that number. So I wrote down another number. Nah, I got, I got no joy over that one either. I, I want to I wanna have joy when I bring my gifts. And so I finally came up with a number. And I shared it with my wife. I said, hey, here's what I think. What do you think? Yeah, it's still a sacrifice. We're still sacrificing. Don't mistake what I'm saying. I couldn't find anywhere in here where it said this is exactly how I was, much I was to give, but I did find a principle that he loves a cheerful giver, and so you know what? I couldn't be cheerful. I would come to church and couldn't be cheerful. And if that's what he loves, then God, give me a number where I am cheerful. And so I finally wrote down a number one. Hey, I'm, all, I'm golden. Like, hey, hey. And that's over and above what we, all, what we normally give here. And we made a decision to give more to the general fund too. So the first thing I want you to understand, the Bible clearly tells us that everybody has at least one gift, and I'm telling you, you got more than one, all of us. Number two, God gave you leaders to help develop your spiritual gifts. Verse 11 says, now these are the gifts that Christ gave to the church. So there were some gifts that are different than just the average you know, spiritual gifts, if you will. He gave some gifts to the church. You're the church. The church is the called out ones. And here are the gifts that he gave. He gave, you know, apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors, and the teachers. And it's their responsibility to equip God's people to do his work and to build up the church, the body of Christ. So one of the roles that Lonnie and I have is not just to teach. This is, you know, what is it, 30 minutes, 35 minutes on a weekend. Throughout the week, we are constantly working with people and praying with people and helping them, equipping them, helping them understand. Chad Pippen, who was playing the guitar right back here a little while ago, okay? When he was in high school, I was his youth pastor, and he would play in, 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 the, in the thing. He was on our worship team. <laughs> it was okay. <laughs> it, was a, you know, it was like, whew, you know. I shouldn't complain because I couldn't play at all. But we had a guy, an older guy. His name was Greg Grubaugh. Remember the Grubaugh's? Greg, now Greg was an incredible guitar player. And he was on the youth staff. And so Greg took Chad under his wing. And the next thing you know, if you will, Chad's like one of the best guitar players in our county. It just didn't happen. Greg Grubaugh said, you know what? I'm going to invest some time, energy, and effort in this younger guy, and I'm going to help him develop these gifts. When I was a kid, I remember the first time my dad took me fishing. And the reason why I remember it is I, I, we didn't do it a lot, but he took me fishing, and I didn't know how to fish. My dad bought all the stuff, man, and next thing you know, man, he's telling me how to, you know, put the worm on the thing and, you know, where to put the bobber and how to cast, and, you know, and I don't know if I ever got one out. I was probably, you know, things are going everywhere. You know, the spool thing was all goofed up. And, you know, I, I didn't know how to do it. But my dad helped me. And there came a moment where I knew how to do, do it because someone helped me. Someone mentored me to get better at it. I was uh, our varsity baseball coach here for a number of years, and I found this little video. It's only like 10 seconds long. Before I show you, you got to set it up. So have you ever been out to a t-ball game? Most of you have. If you haven't, it, it's free, and it's the best comedy you will see <laughs> anywhere on the planet, man. And so it's a little t-ball game, and this little kid's up there, and he's going to hit the ball off the tee. And he just starts running. He didn't know where he's going. He's just running towards the pitcher. And the coach, you know, in T-ball, I couldn't coach T-ball. I, I killed people. But the coach goes running out to grab the kid because he's trying to teach the kid. No, you don't run at the pitcher. You got to run to first. And he grabs the kid, and you're going to see this. And then the kid's, eh, you can tell he's all ticked off because he just wants to, you know, go for the, you know, the pitcher. And the coach is trying to take him over to first. And you can see mentoring going on here. So show, show, show that video here r real quick. Ha <laughs> 
<laughs> hey, I saw that and I said, Lonnie, that's like some of the people we work with. <laughs> you, 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 we're, we're trying, you know, and, ah, I don't want to do it. I, get, I got my own way I want to do it. And, you know, I don't want to do it your way. It's like, dude, I, look, this is kind of how we do it here. It's, it's a beautiful illustration of what, what God's doing in our midst. He gave you gifts, but he also made sure that there were people around, whether they're vocational like Lonnie and I or not. There's a lot of you that aren't vocational, but you know what? You've been given to mentor others, to help others. I guarantee you, that kid's not gonna show up, you know, with Pee Wee Ones or whatever's next, run into the pitcher's mound. He'll learn, he'll learn, he'll learn, he'll learn. And it'll all be because in the baseball world, there are coaches. In the church's world, there's pastors and teachers and people that help come around you, guide you, lead you, help you become everything that God wants you to, to be. So, so number two, God gave you leaders to help develop your spiritual gifts. And last but not least, God gave you your gift or gifts for the purpose of helping to equip others to have a faith that is built to last. And this kind of intersects with number two in this decaying culture. If you look at verse 16, he makes the whole body fit together perfect as each part does its own special work. It helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. See, something amazing is happening when people use their gifts. It's, um, it's a supernatural thing that happens in your life, in my life, in our life. Um, uh, being a follower of Jesus is a it, 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 there's a spiritual dynamic to it. We we believe in angels. We believe in demons. We believe in all of those things. We don't talk about them a whole lot, maybe in the American church, but they're real. We're in a war against demons. They're real. And the last thing the demons want is for you as an individual or us as a church family to fit together, to be full of grace and love and mercy. I don't want that. And according to God's word, if he can just keep, if the devil and the demons can just keep some of you from using your gifts and talents, we're just not gonna fit together the way God wants us to. Oh, I, I wrote this sentence and I was gonna put it on the jumbotrons. I, I may do that tomorrow. I was reading... Uh, I was reading a, a, a devotional and this really made me stop in my tracks and made me think about this and I just read it the other day. And, and, and this is it, just, just listen carefully, just focus in here because I wish you could see it. God isn't just my savior. God is also your savior. In other words, we're saved together. We're saved in a community. We're saved by the same God who wants you to be a blessing to someone else. He wants me to be a blessing to someone else. And he gave us some gifts to pull this off. I think a lot of times we think of our faith as just me. I gave my life to Christ, and I did. But so did you, so did you, so did you, so did you, so did you. And God created this thing called the church. And so it's not just my faith, it's our faith. And we live out our faith in a community. And how this community operates is when we all use our gifts and talents, whatever they might be, to serve others and care about others. It somehow makes our community a holier place a more righteous place. It's not just, well, we need somebody to, you know, hold babies. Well, we do need somebody to hold babies. But it's way, way deeper than that. 
God is at work in our lives as a community, as a community of, of faith. So, so this is what I want you to do. I want everybody to stand up, okay? We're, we're gonna say these, these, these three things out loud uh, together. And we're gonna end with a song and, and, a, and a last uh, word or, or two, okay? So I, I want us to say them out loud, okay? Here we go. Number one, God is giving me at least one spiritual gift. That was horrible. And we're gonna do it again. Here we go. Number one, uh-oh. Number one. God has given me at least one spiritual gift. Number two, God gave me leaders to help develop my spiritual gift. And you're getting good. Number three, God gave me my spiritual gift for the purpose of helping to equip others to have a faith that is built to last in this decaying culture. Wow, isn't that weighty? Father, thanks for a chance to be together and sing and worship and bring our gifts. And may this song be a great way just to kind of end our night. And I pray this in your name. Amen.